people now. Well, we're going, we don't need roads. Jake Hamilton, oh, good hey, in Chicago. Man. Tom, What's good up, to see you again, man. So good to see you. This is generally one of the best performances I've seen in a long time, and I know we have just a little bit of time, so I'm going to jump into it because I have a lot of questions. You, um, yeah, dude, it's uh, truly unbelievable. You know, when when a role that is this physically demanding, this emotionally draining, and this taxing, I've always been curious as to how a role like this affects your personal life. When you go home at the end of the day, your relationship with your friends and your family, how does this per how does this performance just kind of affect? who you are and how you're able to just live your life outside of the movies. I've always been very good at leaving my work at home, uh, at home, at work, um, and not taking it home with me, you know, especially when you're dealing with a character that's going through such horrific things as Cherry is in this film. It's just not healthy to take it home, in my opinion. And I think if I was taking this role home with me every night, I would have had a, men a mental breakdown and it would have just been, it would have been total shutdown. Um, so, so for me, I just try to distract myself. I try to enjoy myself as much as possible. I'm constantly having to remind myself that we are making movies and we are not saving people's lives. So it is not the most important profession in the world So we can enjoy ourselves where we can. That's a great attitude. Um, you know, because Cherry has such an unbelievable life full of these insane moments, I love that you guys in the film divide his life up into chapters and each chapter has a name. You are living quite an unbelievable life right now. If your life were divided up into chapters, what would this chapter you're in right now be called? Uh, do, 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 do. It's only the beginning, maybe. Like that. With, the, with, the, yeah. with the font and the red background, yeah. I like it. That's, that's The road is long oh. ahead or something like that, I don't know. It sounds it sounds good, and it would look good with the font and everything. Um, yeah, the nice you know, big I, red font. It'd be cool. Yes, which I love. Um, you know, I, I love these moments where you get to break the fourth wall and talk directly mm -hmm. to the audience. You you've played some really amazing characters and been in some great scenes in your career. What's another character in another scene where you would love to have had him break the character, break the fourth wall, and tell the audience directly what he's thinking in that moment? We had a few moments in the Spider-Man films where we were kind of toying with the idea of breaking the fourth wall. And we were going to do it in really subtle ways. Like, for example, when May found out I was Spider-Man at the end of Spider-Man 1, Homecoming, uh, she goes, Peter, what the... And I would kind of look at the camera. But it didn't really work. Um, but what I love about Cherry is when he is addressing the audience, when he's looking at the audience, it is Cherry from the future reminiscing about the present. So his tense in which he speaks changes. I tried my best to make my voice lower. Whether or not that worked or not, I don't know. Um, but uh, but I just really liked the challenge of getting that right. It was really difficult, and uh, it went really well. Dude, the movie is absolutely incredible, and your performance is unbelievable. And and the last time you and I spoke, we were in London together, and and I, I made the mistake, or maybe the good decision, of asking you about a like, oh, will there be there will there be a multiverse one day? And that that interview has made. The that was like two two years ago at Far From Home, and, and people won't let it go. So uh, it was. I'm glad that we had that moment. But dude, it's so good to see you, and thank hope you. to see you in person again soon. Brilliant. I'll see you soon, Jake. Thank you. All right. How are you today? So good to see you. I'm doing well. It's great to see you too, Jake. How are you? I'm doing so well. You are so unbelievable in this movie. I have so many questions for you, but seriously, thank you for taking the time and congratulations on it. Um, you know, I, I've read a lot of interviews um, leading up to today where you sort of talk about the difficult scenes to film and, and that you were grateful mm -hmm. to have an acting partner like Tom be there for you. But I wanted to give you a chance to kind of brag on yourself for a minute. What did you give him as an actor? What did you want to sort of step up and make sure that you were doing yourself to make sure that you were there for him to support him? Oh man, you want me to talk about myself? I nice do, thing. I know, I know. <laughs> um, no, I, I think, you know, this is something that we both gave each other, but was space, space to be completely and totally whatever we needed to be in that moment, whether it was just hurt or sad or confused or unbelievably happy and silly and giddy, um, to be a partner that he could lean on um, and come to if he was feeling confused or just needed a second to breathe. Of course, he's got a wonderful team and, and his brother with him as well who could do that. But you know, I think it's different when you're, you know, you're with a person who knows exactly what you're feeling because they're right there feeling it too. Um, I know he certainly was that for me. And I, I hope to some extent I, I could be that for him.
Well, I could just tell from the scenes that that you were. I think you guys were that for each other. Um, this is this is kind of a big question. I was just wondering if you could kind of walk me through one of the days when you guys had to shoot the basically the drug sequences. What what sort of space mm -hmm. you have to be in mentally when you walk on a set that day? Just practically, like what do you guys use for the needles? Kind of the, like the the makeup process looked just unbelievable. Could I, I'm just sort of curious yeah. as to like what that kind of day is like for you. Yeah, those days usually start uh, quite a bit earlier because of the makeup process. You know, usually it's like, oh, you don't wear any makeup. But of course, you know, there's there's a bit that goes into enhancing the uh, less attractive qualities. Sure, um, sure. Um, and, and, you know, adding adding the, the veins and the track marks on the arms. So that, that would probably take up the first two hours of my day. And then I think we usually try to keep things pretty level when we first get on set when we rehearse um without going too deep too fast and then things are usually pretty light and funny and there's a lot of goofing around while they're setting up and then about 20 minutes before we start the scenes um we'd start to calm down and and get ourselves into the proper headspace in terms of props and needles um we had both real and retractable needles so a lot of the scenes that you see where Cherry or Tom is is putting the needle up to my arm. It's actually real, mm -hmm. um, and then we would sort of you know work with angles to make it so that I didn't have to stick it into my arm. Which I don't know if you know. I guess some people on on some movies do shoot themselves up with with saline or or, or sugar water. Um, you couldn't pay me enough money to do that, um, so that was not going to happen. But we were lucky enough to have a great props department that also provided us with the retractable needles. So when we needed to, we could we could fake it properly and safely. It's unbelievable. And 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 as sort of as we wrap up, I'm just sort of curious when you when you do take on a role like this that is physically demanding and emotionally draining and very taxing. I've always been curious as to how that affects your personal life. When you go home at the end of the day, your relationship with your friends, your relationship with your family, how is just your personality affected during the time in which you're making this movie? From the very beginning of the experience, I had a really great support system around me, a group of people who were very conscious about the dark places that this a story telling a story like this can bring you. People who are constantly checking up on me saying like, hey, how are you doing? Let's go out. Let's go get lunch. Let's do this. Let's do that. Keeping me myself. And I found that to be really helpful. But I also think it's important to note the atmosphere that was created on set. You know, the brothers really did create a family environment. That crew is one of my favorite crews that I've worked with. Because of that reason, um, I felt like I had a support system there that could pick me up if I accidentally fell too far. Well, your performance is absolutely just awe-inspiring. And seriously, I, I, I beg to be on this junket because the movie is tremendous. So seriously, thank you so much for taking the time to do it. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Jake. It was really yeah. nice talking with you. Nice talking Have to you. Hopefully one. next time we chat, I'll be in person. I look forward to that day. Uh, guys, so good to see you. Uh, I know you guys know Kevin McCarthy. He's my best friend. I, I, we were texting each other after the movie, and I, and I, I texted him, and the, my initial review was, dude, they directed the fuck out of that movie. Like, you guys, it's just <laughs> unbelievable. So seriously, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, you know, I would imagine that as, as writers and directors and storytellers, you've learned, obviously, a lot on the Marvel movies that you took to make this movie. I'm curious, too, if you had made this movie in a different order, if you had made Cherry before you made Civil War, how different would it have been? What's a skill that you were able to bring from Marvel to Cherry that you wouldn't have had if you had made this movie first? Well, it's interesting. We made our first film pieces in 1994, and it's very similar to Cherry in a lot of ways. Uh, structure, experimentation, stylization. It's really what attracted Soderbergh to us in the first place. So it's a bit of a companion piece, uh, e even, in, even in its, you know, with having an opening coda that you come back to at the end of it. So they're very similar in that regard. Um, I think what the thing that we most gained from the Marvel films is we're big believers in collaboration. We love our crews. We love working with the best people in the business who bring ideas that you don't have to the table and, and enhance the quality of the work. And, and, you know, at Marvel, you attract the best people in the business. So we're able to bring this incredible crew from those movies with us to Cherry, and they really helped out. Um, um, they really helped us bring the vision to screen. But I'll say we, the two differences, uh, if we had made this before the Marvel movies, is number one, we would have made it for a lot less money, which is fine. But number two, we would have had to made it, make it without Tom Holland, which is not okay. 
to your point that which leads into my next question you know i was wondering if you could think back to your first audition with tom whenever you were looking for the right person to play peter parker obviously you weren't looking at this kid thinking could he play you know a former soldier with psd who you know develops a drug habit but did you see things in him beyond what you were just looking for for peter did you look at did you see things as an actor and think like okay he's perfect as peter but like he's kind of got x y and z as well at that point, you know, our needs were so immediate. We were very focused on that role. I mean, as you can imagine, the, the pressure to recast Peter Parker, reintroduce a new v, P, version of Peter Parker, number one, it's a lifelong dream of an opportunity for, for us. Number two, it's, it's an incredibly critical choice. So we were certainly solely focused on that role, finding, finding the best version of that character. But to your point, I will say that we did recognize that Tom was an extraordinary talent. I mean, that, that's something we saw right from the get-go. He was an actor who had uh, really amazing, even at a young age, you know, we cast him as he was still a teenager. Um, he had amazing control of his instrument and he was a very brave performer and, 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 and a smart performer. We could sense that right away. So we knew, knew, we knew he was an immense talent, even if we weren't thinking about anything but Peter Parker. Fair enough. I'm going to try to squeeze one more, one more before they give me the wrap. Um, you know, I, I'm just... I'm so fascinated with the, with your style of, of this movie. I mean, like the, the breaking of the fourth wall, the dialogue on the screen, how you divide it up into chapters. And I'm sort of curious at, as to what point you solidify the creative directorial style of a film like this. Like, is it is it at the beginning in pre-production? You know exactly what it's going to look like. Do, do the wheels start turning like mid-production or is it after everything is shot and you have post-production when you can kind of start tinkering in the editing? It's a process. It's very iterative the way we like to work. It's a bit like jazz. It's impressionistic. Ant and I prepare really hard. Um, we, we like to think through everything. We're academics at heart. So we have a lot of conversations. We have a lot of conversations with our creative collaborators. And then when we get to set, we're willing to throw all that out if we come up with a better idea. Or now that you're in a tangible space with living, breathing actors who are going to make interesting choices, you have to be adaptive to that. You know, so you're really managing tone from the, from the first word of the script to the last edit and editorial. And we'll go to editorial in the evenings, watch it, receive information about what we're shooting, how it's coming across, go back, maybe pick up another close up for a scene because we want a piece of emotion there or, or reshoot a scene or come up with a new idea for a scene. And the other thing is we just make sure we have the tools there to execute. We had overriding principles for each chapter, magical realism, absurdism, realism, horror, psychological horror, you know, like they're, they're all break down very cleanly uh, um, in, into categories, and we use lenses and camera moves and music and, and color, uh, a mise en scène, everything to to help underscore that overriding principle. Um, uh, but uh, but you know we do leave room for improvisation. The movie is nothing short of brilliant. Uh, it's generally it's obviously you know we're only in February, but it's my favorite movie so far this year, and I think it's the first movie I've seen that can I can guarantee will be on my top ten list at the end of the year. So guys, thank you for just continue like just movie after like you you don't know how to make a bad movie, and it's 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 to the benefit of, of all of us. So thank you so much for always being we, a great we interview. Do. We we do I, not well, make well, that. well I haven't seen it yet, so I, I I'm curious to see what that would look like. But guys, seriously, thank you so much for taking the time. I think my buddy Kevin is coming up behind me, so give him a hard time and. Uh, <laughs> You know, I hope you guys are doing well, and I'll see you soon. Take care, man. Take care.